So for those that follow my blog, they know that back in early April, I delivered the liberal arts lecture at North Shore Community College. And so the next series of videos in the weekly pop is going to be kind of a truncated version of that. I'm going to break it up into three episodes. Uh, and instead of doing the talking head thing, we're just going to work through the slide deck. Sound good? Great. So this series that I'm about to give is a culmination of different interests I've had over the years. It mixes together many of them into its own Frankensteinian creation. Uh, this lecture has been an opportunity for me to explain as much to myself as to you how it all fits together. We're going to be talking about a lot of things today and in this series. Uh, things you may find very interesting. Monsters, comic books, movies, and stories of all kind. As the predominant storytelling species of Earth, we love stories. We are constantly looking for stories. We read about them, we watch them, we look for, to social media to like them or comment and become a part of them. Stories are central to our identities. We each have not just a story to tell, but numerous stories. From how our day was, to how we survived high school, to how we got to college, to how we met our partners, and many, many more. But we're also going to talk about something that many people find not so interesting. This. You should recognize this as the symbol for copyright. And I know, I know, it is boring as fudge. Oh, did you think I was going to say something else? We must know some of the same stories. But yeah, copyright. It's boring. And in fact, I think I already know several people are starting to nod off or to go to another video. But I'm hoping you'll see by the time we're done, copyright, as boring as it is, is important to understand and create some rather strange situations in our world today. So bear with me as we unpack copyright, okay? So what is copyright? Well, here's a definition we can work with. My God, it's wordy, but it at least gives us some sense. We can see the areas where copyright is applied, applied to and get a sense of its totality. So I'm going to leave you to pause and actually read through that. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but it's all there. So where did copyright come from in the United States? Well, the first Copyright Act of 1791 was inspired by the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, which says, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and investors, the ex inventors, sorry, the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So what this is saying basically is that people who create things, written works or patents for inventions, should have certain exclusive rights to them for limited times. But why? Why would we limit the amount of time that one has exclusive right to a work? Well, like many things in Western tradition, it comes down to two sides, a dueling tension. On one side, you have the natural rights argument. This stems from the tradition of John Locke. Oh no, not this guy, sorry, I mean this guy. Uh, also known as the father of liberalism, we credit him with how we think of ideas today when we call them intellectual property. The natural rights view is framed as such when watered down. Ideas spring into an individual's mind and therefore are private and intellectual property. The idea property or intellectual property represents potential wealth. As an individual with inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you are owed payment for anyone using your ideas. This, of course, is the cornerstone of modern society. If you create something that has some level of creativity, it is yours to do with as you please. But we also have the utilitarian view, Indivi which says individuals, individual creations are really creations of culture. That is, the individual ideas are drawn from the culture in which they inhabit. And from that, if there is no culture, then the individual is not able to make said intellectual creation. Therefore, ideas are and should be part of the common good for all to benefit from. Now, this isn't, isn't entirely off in some ways. His, we see historically, time and again, new ideas, new patents, new technological breakthroughs often happen repeatedly at the same time or in several different people come up with the same creation. The concept is called multiple discovery. 
And it basically means when more than one person around the same time discovers or creates the same thing or nearly the same thing. Now there's different people we can credit with the utilitarian view, but in the U.S. I'm going to give a nod to Thomas Jefferson. In a letter to Isaac McPherson in 1813, Jefferson included this piece that gets to the crux of the utilitarian view. It is the action of the thinking power called an idea. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening mine. That ideas should freely, should freely spread from one to another over the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of man and improvement of his condition seems to have been peculiarly and benevolently, benevolently designed by nature when she made them, like fire, expansible over all space, without lessening their density in any point. Incapable of confinement or exclusive appropriation, inventions, then, cannot in nature be a subject of property. So when we see limited time, it's because of these two tensions. The natural rights view and the utilitarian view are at odds, and this is how it is resolved. It becomes part of the culture after a limited time. So that raises the question, what do we consider limited times? In an age, you know, if someone says to you, this, this offer has a limited time, how long do you usually think you've got? I mean, in an age of Amazon, it may be minutes, right? How long did copyright originally last back in the 1700s? Well, 14 years, and then you could renew it for another 14. So if a work, so if you created a work, you could profit from that work as you saw fit for 28 years in total. Does that seem like a reasonable limited time? Okay, so how long does copyright extend to today? Life of the creator plus 70 years. So that means my copyright on this presentation deck would expire at the earliest, assuming I live another 30 years, sometime around 2118, where this video would become, uh, would expire around 2118. This term, limited time, is so strange. I mean, if I'm 10, 15, 20 years dead, my limited time on Earth has long passed its expiration date, but the copyright for something I created somehow continues for decades. How did it get to this? Well, this has largely been a result of publishers and other creative industries lobbying Congress to extend copyright for so long, because generally the publishers, not the authors, are the ones that are profiting for decades after the creator's death. So what happens after a copyright expires? What does that mean? It goes to the public domain. The public domain is where creative works that anyone can use in any manner, including in order to repurpose into new creative works. So what are some of the works in the public domain? Here are some examples. And they probably are quite familiar and quite well known. But is there anything between, public, uh, between copyright and public domain? Or is all work doomed to be locked, or, locked away for upwards of a century or more? Well, there is. The creator has a variety of rights, and one of them is the ability to grant licenses for their work. One of the most powerful and popular licenses out there is the Creative Commons license. Now, you might have noticed this icon at different places. Um, I've certainly given my work, my videos, my blog, uh, the Creative Commons license, which means that others are welcome to use them as they see fit with just two stipulations. They give me credit as a source, and they also make sure that whatever they create has Creative Commons licenses. Those are two of the choices uh, you can use with a Creative Commons license, but at its core, it allows creators to designate their work free to use by others. We'll come back to this in the third episode uh, of this series, but it's worth laying the groundwork now. Okay, so thank you for bearing with me through that portion of the presentation in series. I realize, you know, technical jargon is not fun for everyone, or anyone for that matter. But we've made it through that part of, that part of it, and now we can get to talking about more interesting things. Or so I hope. 
What we were just talking about is how a work goes from being owned by an individual to being part of the culture. When a work enters the public domain, we consider it becoming part of the cultural commons. In this case, we call it commons just like we would label an area of land, such as the Boston or Salem commons. It is there for everyone, or at least should be. Creators can also choose to put their work into the commons before their copyright expires. So what we've done here is identified a tension between personal interest of the individual creator and the public interest of the culture. And the argument isn't whether there should be copyright to protect creators, but the degree as we've seen, the degree as we have seen, raises some significant concerns. After all, here are some of here are some authors that aren't in the public domain. And I wonder how many of us watching this were alive when they were. For those who've taken world or American literature, you'll notice that many of these are well-established but clearly long-dead authors. But they are still locked behind copyright. Right, so we can think of the public domain as the commons, an intellectual space where we can draw, we are free to draw upon, use, alter, and reproduce the creative works of the past into the present. And this can be done in many interesting ways. It can give us such fascinating works as Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, a book that intersplices the writings of Jane Austen with an entirely new plot element, zombies. And okay, for some of us, that might not be the most glowing example of the importance of the commons. Maybe you're not into pale, mindless humanoids groaning their way through life. Or maybe you're just not a fan of zombies. And so while that's not a glowing example, this one is. So let's talk about a little well-known work called the Iliad. Someone call, we call Homer wrote the Iliad. And just like sequels are popular today, he follows it up with the Odyssey two epic works that have been super influential in Western literature. While at the time he thought he was covering some epic history, today we see his work as historical fiction in the form of epic poetry. But he does produce an enormously creative and popular work. It's such a popular work that everyone riffs off it for thousands of years. There are many examples, but I'm going to stick to the highlights reel for this, for this video. In, four, in the 400 BCE, Aeschylus produces the trilogy, the Oresteia trilogy. Yes, a trilogy. They were popular back then, too. And he uses characters from the Iliad and tells a completely new story. Back then, they called it the literary tradition. And today, for some reason, we call it fan fiction. Jump ahead to the first century BCE, Rome, and Virgil writes the, Ane the Aeneid, which is his own epic standalone plot line in the world of Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. You could kind of think of it as similar to Star Wars Rogue One. It's not needed, but there was a desire to tell it. Later on in the 14th century, Dante includes Odysseus from the Odyssey in the Eighth Circle of Hell. Geoffrey Chaucer also wrote, or I should say adapted, Troilus and Cressida in the 14th century from somebody else's writings. This poem focused on the titular characters and how they are pulled into the politics and violence that consume the Iliad. Even William Shakespeare fanfics his way in by also adapting Chaucer's work into his play, Troilus and Cressida, in 1602. Yeah, I totally just said that's Shakespeare fanfics. My literature colleagues are either twitching with anger, ready to get the pitchforks, or they're ready to give me a, a fist bump. The grammarians among them are a bit appalled that I just turned fanfiction into a verb. But I digress. If it feels like everyone is borrowing from everyone, it's because they are. That is the history of storytelling in a nutshell. It's over 2,000 years later, and we are still retelling the stories of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Sometimes we revisit the stories themselves, as in the case of these books and films. These stories attempt to retell the Iliad and the Odyssey in ancient Greece. But then, of course, there's loads of fiction that decides to modernize Riff or use Homer's work as the basis for new works. And of course, these don't include specific episodes of TV or comics that take on Homer's work in some fashion. Do you know where I first encountered the Odyssey when I was younger? I learned about the Odyssey through DuckTales, the 1980s 
cartoon series long before I ever encountered it as a book to read. So why am I talking about a storyteller from 3,000 years ago? Who cares? Well, this was a popular story, one that we came back to many times before. And we've done that with many stories in our past. I could have chosen stories from the Bible, Dante, Beowulf, Shakespeare, or Edgar Allan Poe, or Sherlock Holmes. We see these stories told back time and again. We revisit these stories for the same reason. Because you cannot step twice into the same river. Every time we come back to a story, it is different. We are different. When we reread or retell stories, we are thinking about how both have changed since the last time we encountered them. That's exactly what we've been doing for millennia. In that vein, remakes and sequels are not a sign of unoriginality, but a sign of engaging with our past to consider and look at what we may have missed in the past, or how we make sense of those stories in the present. I find retellings of the past fascinating and exciting because they pick apart that what we likely missed, or make us think about them in different ways. They are as rich in creative works as those that don't directly call upon such works. But again, why? Why does it matter in the context of copyright and commons? Well, here's the first big point to consider. We engage with the past stories in creative retelling only when they are part of the commons, that is, the public domain. This is important because it is a dialogue with and reflection about our past with our present. It's a powerful opportunity to understand how, to, how the two fit together. But that only happens if we're able to freely use such previous works. Consider this. Imagine if you were writing your autobiography at the age of 75, but you could only draw upon your memories and experiences from when you were 25 years old. How effectively could you tell your story? Right now, we draw upon tales, but we can only do it with works that have been created before 1923, or works, or, or with creators' works who have died before 1948. That is, most creators will never get the chance to play with works that were created in their lifetime, or even before they were born. The only exceptions are when the copyright holders grant permission, either through, copy, either through Creative Commons license or often usually within limited and narrow ranges to which the copyright holder believes will not hurt their intellectual property. And I think that's a loss for us, creatively and culturally. It denies us an opportunity to create and explore our immediate past and engage with what it might mean. Okay, so I'm going to end here. And we're going to get back to tackle the next part of this lecture in the next episode. All right, that's all for today. Uh, what did you find useful or interesting about today's episode? I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear them in your ideas. So post them in the comments below, or hit me up on Twitter at Leeton, L-E-A-T-O-N zero um, one. So see you soon. Keep popping. Keep thinking.